Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the regular meeting of the Council of the City of Southfield for Monday, December 12, 2011. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jordan? Here. Mr. Frazier? Here. Mr. Fertiassi? Here. Mr. Steiger? Here. Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Lamb? Here. Ms. Seymour? Uh, here. You have seven members present. Thank you. Uh, this item on the agenda is a presentation of three members to the Emergency Management Volunteer Program. That's the mayor's presentation. Good evening um, to the listening audience or honorable council. Tonight I would like to call up Mr. Frank Coots and um, two of our new volunteers. Uh, thank you to the council. Um, and administration for supporting the emergency manager and emergency management volunteer program. I want to introduce our newest members who have joined us, Ray Moore, would you raise your hand, Ray, and Ryan Brown. We have another new member, uh, Ms. Bobby Reed, who for a very good reason, she's been unemployed for a long time, and tonight she, she got a job tonight, was her first night on a new job, so she would be here with us tonight. Our um, volunteers perform many tasks in our emergency management program. They are very important and they do all of the, what they do without pay. I have been very committed to volunteers in this department uh, by charter, which is reports um, has the opportunity to appoint the director. They help us at community events and City events and they're trained to respond and assist in disaster incidents in our community. There's a lot of training that goes into these volunteers and we're very honored to increase our number of volunteers. Our program of volunteers is a 50 year old program and annually donate over 2,000 hours of community service. Many people cannot donate their time and that makes those who volunteer very special citizens. And our residents and community benefit from our volunteers. Some believe that the volunteers are the core of our city. They add to the character, the safety, and the quality of our life in our community. It's with great pride tonight that I recognize those who have recently joined our program. But the one thing that I do want to say is that we need more people. The more people who volunteer, who help in our boards and commissions and on this wonderful uh, emergency management team that we have, who are trained to assist the city in the case of emergency, is we need. Our, uh, we have a very active radio, band radio, amateur radio, amateur radio program. As you know, those of us who went through the power outage a few years ago, um, the amateur radio became a very handy tool in our city. So if you're willing to volunteer, have the time, and want to do something to give back to the city, I encourage you to contact our director, Mr. Frank Coots, who's here at 248-796-5990, or check on our web page for more information. At this time, I want to introduce Mr. Frank Coots and let him have a few words. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Council President, uh, I'm Frank Coos, the Emergency Management Director, and I'd like to uh, reiterate some of the words the Mayor said, that uh, thank you, Council, for your support over the years of the Emergency Management Program and all the components within, one of them being the Emergency Management Volunteers. We enjoy a cadre that fluctuates of between 30 and 40 people who give their time to serve the community. They meet at least once a month, they train at least once a month, they're ready to, uh, on request, help uh, assist our public safety. They're trained in some basic things like search and rescue, basic first aid, uh, debris removal. So they're more hands and bats to help in, when needed in a disaster event. Uh, once again, thank you for your continuing support. I personally would like to welcome Ray Moore and Ryan Brown, and she couldn't be here for, like the mayor said, uh, today's a good day for Ms. Bobby Reed, her first day at work. Um, thank you all for your support. Let's give them a round. <laughs> Madam Chair, it's um, 
Council, uh, Ms. Lenny Taylor, who stepped up when we uh, asked her to, to serve, and we've never officially said thank you or goodbye to her. So tonight, I just would like to say to Ms. Lenny Taylor how much I appreciate your service, how um, we um, really respect you for serving this community. You've always been there, and while the election said something different, we know your heart and your uh, dedication to the city remains strong. And I just want to personally say thank you. Public service is not easy. Uh, sitting in that seat is one that, uh, as you know, requires a lot of sacrifice. So I just want to publicly say thank you. Good evening. I just would like to say thank you, Madam Mayor. And I want to say thank you to all of the council. I really have grown over the last two and a half years, and it's been my honor to serve uh, the city of Southfield and to learn and to serve with you. So thank you very much. I would add that it was a pleasure to serve with you. Thank you. To me too. <laughs>
establish the relocation. The funding is 95% or $23,940 from the Michigan Department of Transportation and 5% or $1,260 from the major streets budget for a total project cost of $25,200. Item B is a technical adjustment to the Intergovernmental Agreement for Police Department Grants from the U.S. Department of Justice. These grants have provided funding for various pieces of equipment and updated technology. The grants are through Oakland County acting as the fiscal agent. The City of Pontiac was an original participant and a signatory on the original agreement. Since Pontiac no longer has a separate municipal police department, as the Oakland County Sheriff's Department now provides Pontiac police protection, changes in the text of the agreement have to be made. Council approval for initiating these changes is required, with said amendments to the agreement being subject to review and approval as to form by our City Attorney's Office. Item C is the formal acceptance of $150,238,000 in funding from the Suburban Mobility Authority for Regional Transportation, also known as SMART, to help support our transportation program for Southfield seniors and physically or mentally challenged persons of all ages. This includes transportation to medical appointments and other everyday needs of our residents who have no other means of transportation. Because the $156,238 figure from SMART represents a decline of $24,434 or 13.5% in SMART funding, a transfer of past year's money in the activity that were accumulated in years when SMART revenues were higher is also recommended to fully fund this program for the remaining six and one half months left in fiscal year 2011-2012. Item D is authorization to enter into an agreement with the Michigan Department of Transportation for that state agency to fund the city's cost of performance monitoring of the Bridge Street Bridge, which abuts eight miles between Telegraph and Beach Road. Excuse me. Between Telegraph and Beach Road for a nine-year period, one year of retroactivity, and the next eight years going forward. By way of review, to both assist the business community adjacent to the bridge and serve the interests of advancing the field of civil engineering as it relates to bridge construction, safety, and maintenance, the city of Southfield led the way in the design and construction of the first of its kind dual modular construction bridge with side-by-side lanes. Traditional bridge technology on the one side to be compared in durability and overall cost to the newer carbon fiber technology on the other side. This agreement for nine years of in-depth funding ensures that the computerized data collection and analysis from this composite bridge will continue at no further cost to our taxpayers. To add to the body of knowledge necessary to help address bridge construction and rehabilitation challenges across the country. Our public work staff is to be commended for their advocacy, which was a key component in achieving state funding to support this type of research. Item E is adoption of the recommended resolution to establish year-end fund balance allocations in accordance with government accounting standards for pronouncement 54, generally accepted municipal accounting principles, and the financial policies and procedures of the city of Southfield. This is one of the final steps necessary for the timely and complete filing of the city's annual audit with the state treasurer. Item F is authorization for city staff to initiate a competitive bid process for the sale of the Franklin Orchard condominium, which originally came under the ownership of the city of Southfield, to facilitate major road improvements. The response to this bid process will come back to city council for formal review and consideration.
If I may, through the chair, I apologize. The wrong copy must have been included in the packet. There was a signed form that was dated. There was a signed form. There is a signed form.
not disagreeing with you, but you still need to establish a fund. Otherwise, we might lose some arguments that offer to us. I understand that. I understand that. But I think we need to do both. Well, let's put this... Do we need a motion for this? We don't. We don't? Let's put this on the agenda, then we'll put it in the agenda. I have a question, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, to the administrator, you had a million two left of the city's portion that was already to be donated. What account would that have gone into? In other words, is there an account already established because it's already had grants to a million one already offered to the city and were turned down? Chair, if we had planned to construct, it would have been with the building authority and the funding would have been through the building authority. That's not where we are right now. Where we are right now is a fundraising mechanism. So, I'm not sure how we would do that. That's why I think we need some time to determine how we would do that. What would be the goal for this so-called fundraising group to raise? To 2.4 million? We need a plan. Good question. We have to start with where we are now, what's been committed in parks and rec budgets, deduct for the grants at this point, and decide on how we would go forward. Is this a regular meeting that's scheduled or is it a... Oh, this is the COW for the field zone. It was one item agenda, the field zone. Right. And so, I just thought maybe at least we could start the discussion at that point. I'm not sure whether we would get all the details worked out, but I thought we should start the discussion then. So, we would only have one item on that agenda. Mr. Sherrod, what happens to the...
And the first uh, name on this list is Mr. Robert Lacoop. I think he was here earlier. Is he still here? Yes, ma'am, I am. Apologize for the lateness of the <coughs> That's quite all right. Good evening, Honorable Council, Madam, Madam Mayor, and extended staff. Once again, my name is Robert A.M. LeCouf. I'm the Executive Vice President of the South Hill Police Officers Association. My current address is as follows, 22206 East 12 Mile Road in the city of St. Clair Shores, Michigan, the zip code there is 48081. I'm currently assigned to the Uniform Patrol Division here in the city of South Hill. I've been here for the last 15 and a half years approximately. I primarily respond to 911 calls within the city that, that deal with a variety of runs, such as alarms, domestic disputes, robberies, accidents, so on and so forth. I'm here to speak on behalf of the union on two other issues. Uh, earlier we spoke of the Carpenter Lake. The remaining two issues that I have to discuss are health care in the village. I was very pleased to hear uh, by several council members that we're well funded and not under much distress currently. In September of 2011, Senate Bill 7 was passed by the House and the Senate in Lansing and, and signed by the governor, in which public safety was now responsible for 20, er, in, in which public safety was responsible for an 80-20 plan in which 20% of the health care would be pushed off onto the employee or a hard cap or a possible opt-out of the plan and a loss of some revenue sharing. For the first time in history that I'm aware, police officers in this city are being forced to spend a portion of their bi-weekly paycheck in order to maintain health care benefits for themselves and family members. Over many contracts throughout the years, long before I was here, police health care was formed and fought for to maintain. The city has chosen to opt for the hard cap, which is at an even greater, greater savings in our belief due to the fact that we're self-insured. At times when Oakland County and Warren has opted out or formulated a, plan, formulated a plan in order to make it work for their employees. We have not here. Back in October, those effective deductions began, uh, the, de the effective deductions were put in place and employees were charged on a bi-weekly basis to keep their health care. Digressing back for a moment to June in 2011, the House and Senate also passed Public Act 54, which the governor signed which froze wages, vacation, and longevity benefits for those unions that were out of contract, in which we currently are. From June through December, increases were provided to those employees and members. A grievance was filed at the, at the advisement of our business agent at the POAM involving the benefit plan year, in which Blue Cross has stated to us begins in October and ends in September every year. December's holiday check reflected that vacation time was taken back by the city and hourly increases were also reduced to June's levels. The affected parties at that time were eight police officers, four supervisors, and four dispatchers. Throughout the last week, when this previous holiday check came out, there were several inconsistencies in payroll, which has since been corrected. We view, this as a, we, we view this issue as a bullying tactic. We have filed a second grievance on behalf of the union with violation of the contract and the bargaining agreement during 312 arbitration. To the best of my knowledge, over the last 27 years, from what I can locate, and I can be corrected if, if, 
job, the city continues to do more with less. We understand that. Many other departments are running short at this particular time. Being a police officer for this city is a 24-hour, a day, seven-day operation. We don't close. We always respond and we do the work that no one else wants to. We do it because we love it and we've learned to improvise and adapt and overcome the many situations throughout the years. And we will continue to do it. We're a strong group of warriors and we are a band of brothers that work for this city and we will continue to do our best for each and every one of you. The last issue that I want to briefly bring up involves the millage. The millage was settled and passed overwhelmingly by the people in this city, by 83% to the best of my knowledge. At that particular time of the millage, we were 25 individuals short between the police and fire departments and approximately 145 city employees shy. As I speak to you today, we are currently short 26 police officers to include the chief of police and 13 with the fire department and approximately 200 employees citywide. In pulling this uh, fact, I pulled this off the city fact sheet. In addition, and it basically states, in addition to the 25 unfilled police and fire positions, the city has also cut 145 positions at that time over the last seven years. If the millage proposal fails, the further cuts that will be necessary to balance the budget will involve layoffs of approximately 50% of police and EMS personnel. Even though the millage did pass, Mr. Charette was quoted as stating costs will still need to be cut for the next three years at 2.5%. At what point, I guess the question I have at this point for council, is at what point are these positions that are vacant going to be filled? All I would ask is that I could, if I could close, I'm closing. I'm done speaking on uh, behalf of any item. I would just ask that you would reconsider these issues, and in closing, I want to take this moment to once again thank the Honorable Council, Madam Mayor, and extended staff and citizens for this opportunity to discuss these pressing issues that are of great importance to the men and women of this police department. And I'd like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to uh, you as well as all the other city employees. And God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have to respect our police department coming before us and uh, telling us of their uh, uh, feelings towards certain issues. However, we are in negotiations. I'd sure like to hear from our city attorney whether we are uh, setting a precedent here or or uh, how do we proceed? And there's questions being asked that we cannot answer. Well, and we're kind of being sitting here like ducks on a Right. <laughs> through the chair, uh, several of these issues uh, are, are actively within the grievance resolution process under the collective bargaining agreement. Um, we've also received uh, correspondence from uh, the attorneys of the POAM. Um, that you know there may be some litigation in terms of an unfair labor practice, something along those lines. So obviously, in terms of this forum, I think the appropriate forum is is set forth in the collective bargaining agreement. We're we're actively under that uh, in terms of these issues, and, and that's the appropriate forum to to address these. So my question is: Do we sit here like ducks on a pond and just listen, or or before well, everything that is being brought up to our negotiating team. Well, I think we are aware as a negotiating team of the issues, and, and we are, again, those kinds of issues are being addressed, but in the appropriate, appropriate form. Okay. But Thank you. These people have asked to be, and we have granted them permission, and I understand Mr. Prakowski's uh, statement, but, um, and I, I should, I should uh, mention, I suppose, follow up to your comments to the uh, members of the um, uh, police department here. First of all, I think people have to know, uh, our employees have to know that we have always supported um, the benefits for the best of, of everything for our police and fire department. Uh, we appreciate all of the quality service that our department has, um, uh, the quality of service and the quality of the people that work for us. But a lot of these things are the result of things that are going on in the city capital. And I just, for the record, want to read a statement following what our city attorney has said. Um, 
um, and the and response that the legal department has provided me. And as you know, the issues that you are raising are currently the subject of dispute resolution proceedings established with the collective bargaining process or mandated by newly enacted state laws and cannot be responded to in this forum. However, we'd like to point out that the city's position relative to these employee benefits have been negotiated with and accepted by five other bargaining units within the city along with other non-union groups, totaling 407 city employees, at least 300 of which are union members. Having said that, again, I want to repeat that we've always supported the very best for our city and we're happy to do so. We are because our union dispute resolution in the court bargaining process. I can't comment, but uh, unfortunately what the state is doing affects a lot of what's happening to you right now. Madam Chair, I didn't mean the question to the city attorney to in any way uh, deny these individuals the right to get up here and, I, I and speak. So I just want to make that clear that they're all welcome to come up right. here and, and uh, say whatever they are. But I want to be clear of what I can or cannot we say. We cannot respond. That you are correct about that. Um, Due to the lateness of the hour, I think we really need to respect our time and mm -hmm. the time of the citizens that are here as well. And if we can keep everybody in the meeting to the what we allow to find. Right. Um, the next request is Wendell Ramwich. Mm -hmm. I hope I pronounced that correct. Is he here? Apparently not present. Um, Ms. Marie Henry. She's gone. Not present. Uh, Julius. Uh, I'm going to decline my opportunity. Thank you. You'll decline, all right, Julius. Uh, Ms. Gerald, I will accept my opportunity. You know that Gerald was in the rest of the record and we have five minutes. As you've often stated, Madam Chair, I come before this council quite often more than most residents. And I think it's safe to assume that I understand the procedure and protocol, but thank you for your uh, memory to remind me of that. Um, I just wanted to say real quickly that if my presence coming before this council causes a negative reaction to anybody sitting up there, or if your significance is diminished by my facial expression, you have given me the power. And tonight, Mr. Fricasi, you gave me the power, and I'm not even trying to get it. You know, the chairperson of this council meeting said to stay focused on the Carpenter Lake issue. You couldn't even stay focused on the issue for being focused on Pamela Durham. So you give me significance, and you make me relevant to come before this council and speak on behalf of what I believe in and the people of Southfield, because I'm one of those people. So I want to get right into the point. Madam Chair, you talked about the consistency of the agenda and the way we do things. You said tonight, quote unquote, that you don't have to give your address, that you could give it to the city clerk. And you made two of the people that spoke on the Carpenter Lake issue give their address. And I agree with the mayor. Possibly, I think you did it because you wanted to bring attention to the fact that they didn't live in the city. But if they work in the city and for the city, their address is not important. Their service to the city and their opinion about a city issue that affects them becomes more important than their address. And I think that that was a, what I'm going to call a politrick. That was a power play and a political move on your part. And you know, you and I have had some not so nice experiences. When you want to, you act like rough and tough Madam Chair Jane Seymour. But when you don't get your way, all of a sudden you want to back down and act like Little Miss Muffet, intimidated by everything. And you need to be consistent with your persona that you're going to give me and the public. Now let's talk about Carpenter Lake again. If you remember, I stated at the beginning of the year how this city was not frugal with their spending. We had an opportunity to buy Carpenter Lake for $250,000, and it's alleged that a member up there on council blocked that and had to turn the grant back in, and again, I stand to be corrected. At the time, someone else bought Carpenter Lake for $250,000. 
Carpenter Lake was then sold back to the city of South Bend, or sold to the city, not back, correction, Pam Gerald, sold back to the city, or sold to the city, sold to the city for $1 million. So we spent an extra $750,000 for Carpenter Lake when we could have acquired it for $250,000. Now, that extra $750,000 could have been an interpretive center, it could have been modifications, it could have been renovations, but no, we spent it because we had it. We had a budget surplus. Now we are missing that $750,000. Now, again, through the chair, Mr. Charette, I talked about the fact that it was purported that one of the acting chiefs was talking to some of the police officers, which was a violation of the good faith bargaining process. You were rude and loud to me. You tried to call attention to Pam Gerald because you guys got me labeled and stereotyped to be this level orange security threat. Well, I decided to dye my hair orange so you won't forget that, or what I'm going to call chestnut, golden chestnut, and to also make me look a little softer. So at my height and my weight that I won't appear to be threatening and intimidating. But all you said through the chair was that the acting chief wouldn't do it anymore. So we always talk about a standard, a manner in which we do things, policy and procedure, and we don't always do it. Now these officers, we're talking about the grant, the grant for Carver and Delay, but we got a $2.2 million safer grant that is still dangling suspended animation. You're talking about the deadline for the Carver and Delay grant. What about the firefighter deadline? We need police and fire and EMS and not a nature center right now. Didn't say it was a bad idea. People are not against it, but it's not imperative to the survival of this city. Now let's talk about being intelligent, creative, and innovative. And to do that, we are not doing that. And lastly, I just wanted to also congratulate our city planner for being here a little over six months, less than a year, for his 5% pay increase. That's an insult to every single employee that has put time, effort, and sweat and tears into their position doing more with less and they have not gotten a 5% pay increase. Now, in the famous words of our chair, to go against the Carpenter Lake after it was all decided, you said it was de-energizing and demoralizing. I think to give someone that hasn't paid their dues to this city a 5% pay increase is de-energizing, demoralizing, and it is putting this city in a bad morale position. These employees are tired of doing more with less while we're still spending money like we still got big fat pockets and giving out a 5% pay increase. I thought it was a pay freeze. How did this happen? Now I know you're not going to answer me, which is fine. I don't need five minutes of fame. And to the residents, Ms. Joyce, Ms. Henry, and the rest of you that call me at home and you know who you are, thank you for calling. Again, my number is 248-352-9188. And my little angel at the post office told me that my blessings come from the south and not the north. I am a daughter of the Most High God. I ask him every time I get up here at this podium to order my words like he does my steps, and he does it. So thank you, my Heavenly Father, for ordering my words like you do my steps. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Karen And before I give my um, name and address, I just want to say uh, to Ms. George and the rest of the council that I've waited a long time. Some people are getting extra time. Uh, you, you did call a couple of people last uh, meeting that I attended that didn't put in a request to speak. So there's an appearance that it may be subjective of who can go over and who can't. 
I'm going to try to keep this to five minutes as much as possible, but I just want to make it clear that it should have the appearance of equalness all the way around. I, I totally agree with you, but I was having trouble with my stopwatch. Okay, and uh, last meeting also, too, I had a person time me in the audience. I had rehearsed my speech at home very diligently, and uh, the person keeping the time on me advised me I was cut off uh, after four minutes. So I'm going to start. My name is Stephanie English. I live at 28735 San Carlos, South Hill, Michigan, 48076. And I'd like the time to start from now. I'm here again to address the 40 plus time card fraud embezzlement occurrences allegedly carried out by the current acting chief of police, Brian Gerald. Because the city administrator is appointed by and serves at the pleasure of the council members, he gets the pass tonight, and my notice is directly. Uh, directed at the senior members and all other members of the council and the city attorney. I'm stating that the police chief appointment appears to be fixed or steered due to um, what is perceived as pressure or hard influence by two senior council members especially. I've worked diligently on the behalf of officers who contacted me anonymously over the past four weeks to get their concerns of corruption to be properly investigated by an outside police agency as required if a chief of police has to be investigated. The primary issues to consider are these. The calls I received over the past month were from officers who were very upset and worked up at the possibility of Chief Gerald being appointed as the permanent chief of police. I was very careful and very aggressive in determining if their statements were credible and I did want to vet any of the information before I brought it forward. For the record, these are not individuals who have had any discipline issues. These, issues who I've, these individuals who I've spoken with are stressed at the potential of an individual who they deem as unethical or without integrity or low integrity to lead them. They sought out any community member they thought would be able to push their deep concerns forward and aggressively. As I have stated before, I did not ask for this type of responsibility. But our police officers are very important assets of our community, and their concerns are warranted based on hard evidence from a respected police lieutenant for us to fully support where, where that evidence can fully support all of the allegations against Chief Gerald. I have in my possession a confidential memo written by Chief Gerald, which states his admission that he conducted his own investigation pertaining to these time fraud allegations, and that he went into and changed his own records. This document was dropped inside of my screen door. I cannot determine, but it was between the dates of November 28th and December 1st. As I asked at the 28th meeting, November 28th meeting, if an investigation had been done, and I was, uh, Sid Lance told another speaker and myself, but the other speaker that he admonished and told that this full investigation had been done. When I asked the results of this, when I asked who conducted it, no answers were given. I advised that it was highly improper and illegal for a person of that position to investigate himself, and if it had been done so, it is illegal and improper. When I asked these questions directly to the council, no one gave me an answer. But I suspect now it's potentially possible that you all had this memo already in hand, and that's why no one responded to my questions. The other important issue is that there is an appearance of a conflict of interest with the city attorney, Jack Barrett, or Sue Ward, to answer my FOIA request, which some of the FOIA requests have been denied, but some have been granted, or any other inquiry that I'm doing on behalf of the police officers, because Chief Gerald's wife, was the executive assistant to our city attorney and perhaps a personal or professional friend of both of the attorneys, which could be deemed as a reason that proper vetting or elimination of Brian Gerald as a police chief candidate wasn't done. This appears to be a vehicle to suppress or cloak evidence that would eliminate Chief Gerald as a chief of police candidate for the city of Southfield or to even punish or terminate him for proved any for any proved defenses of time embezzlement. I'm putting the council and the law department on notice that you have a moral and spiritual responsibility to the citizens of Southfield and to the police personnel 
to fully and fairly investigate this matter and to clear any path of potential obstruction or influence so our city administrator can proceed with the proper action without pressure from who he reports to, which is you, the council. Let him, let our city administrator act with a high moral standard that I trust him to carry out. This issue is serious, and I'm asking the council to please not let our business activity and our city ethics mirror communities such as Detroit, Wayne County, Easters, Highland Park, and most recently Penn State, where corruption and other ethical standards have been exhibited. Your time is up, please. Thank you. Are there any questions pertaining to this? No. Good job. I am going to read a response regarding this matter because I want to run through it. This is sent from our city administrator to all the mayor and city council with regard to this situation. A detailed, I'm going to read it, a detailed review of the expressed concerns regarding time reporting of an individual in the Southfield Police Department was initiated. Pertinent records were reviewed as well as general principles of scheduling and time allocation applicable to professional managerial personnel who do not receive overtime compensation. This review resulted in the following findings. The reporting process and procedures were consistent among the deputy chiefs. Number two, a minor discrepancy was found and was corrected, resulting in 32 hours of vacation being removed from the employee's vacation bank on October 1, 2009. Number three, a change in payroll record keeping procedures was instituted to avoid similar recording errors in the future. These record keeping issues were investigated in 2009 by then Chief Dr. Joseph E. Thomas, who made the determination that any error was inadvertently made and that 32 hours was the appropriate adjustment to the employee's vacation bank. And number five, there was no violation of police department policy on the use of city vehicles. The view from the broadest context is of utmost importance. All parties can rest assured that the Southfield Police Department continues as a leading department in the region and throughout the state. Our policies and procedures are frequently used as best practices, models, and training seminars, and we are acclaimed by law enforcement experts as a department that enforces the law with sensitivity to the rights of all parties. Claims against the city are at a 20-year low as a result of the respectful diligence and high standard of conduct of our outstanding police officers. The view from the street is obviously a good one. Citizen complaints are extremely rare. It's respectfully submitted by James G. Charette, City Administrator. What does that mean? That's right. What's the date of that? December 1, 2011. All right, we're going to... Is Ms. Cynthia Hawk here? Ms. Cynthia Hawk is not coming here. Samuel Q. Biggins, the third. I think it's Ms. Kelly Pate. Not present. Mr. Damon Bryant. Mr. Nick Kazan. Not present. Patrick Odenbaker. Did I make a mistake? She said he wasn't here. She didn't pronounce his name. She said he wasn't here. All right, Matthew Huber. Matthew Huber. Keith, I'm not sure if I'm saying this. Topin. Topin. Apparently not here. Mr. David Adams. Apparently not here. That concludes our communications portion. Any other business coming forward, counsel? Thank you.
just wanted to wish everyone happy holidays and uh, safe holidays and uh,